Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. Yesterday, uh, sadly, we had a little hitch in our get-along, and for some reason or another, weren't able to uh, do the broadcast. So there was a rerun yesterday. So today, this morning, we will pick up where we left off Tuesday at the end of the broadcast on page 294 of the book, The Papacy and the Civil Power, near the end of the page. Remember, we're talking about that part that Emperor Constantine played in the Arian heresy and the calling of the Council of Nice to settle a dispute that was raging within the church. And the author points out several writers of the period that wrote about these uh, concerns, indicating that the Pope of Rome, which was not even called the Pope, back then, was only called the Bishop of Rome, was hardly even mentioned throughout the whole controversy. And the Roman Catholic Church, particularly the papacy today, uses this example of the Arian heresy and of the calling of the Council of Nice as a precedent, a precedent whereby the papacy demonstrated its divine right authority to rid the world of heresy. Now, history, the facts of history, prove that the so-called Bishop of Rome, now known as the Pope, was almost nothing but an observer of the situation. And when the Council of Nice was called, sent prelates to represent him because of his old age. He was not even able to participate in this so-called Uh, uh, precedent-setting council. Now, these writers have each taken their turn giving evidence that the Pope of Rome, which didn't even exist at that time, the Bishop of Rome, had almost nothing to do with it. it. says, at the bottom of the page, it says, it is therefore manifest that the Christian sentiment which Eusebius attributes to Constantine was not that exclusive and sectarian sentiment which the clergy at Rome were then endeavoring to establish, and which, as he could readily foresee, would widen rather than close up the breach. Now remember, also I want to add that as we continue reading this, keep in mind that what we're talking about is the predominant controlling role of the Emperor Constantine in this matter. Now, I want to refer to the Scriptures at this point. We are told in the Scriptures by Paul that there was a restrainer that was restraining the rise of Antichrist, that man of sin who exalts himself above the name of God, that son of perdition, who sits in the temple of God, showing himself to be God. Who is that restrainer? We're talking about him right now, Constantine, the emperor of the Roman Empire. He was the controlling uh, uh, power during this Arian crisis. And we will see, as we continue our reading and discussion of this incident, of this council, that it wasn't until after this council, when Constantine took his part, uh, took his place of residence in Constantinople, only then was the papacy able to rise in enough power to fulfill the prophecy. So Constantine is the restrainer. Now I know that's not what's taught in the churches, but history is a better account of the fulfillment of Bible prophecy than some uh, so-called theologian who speculates, and especially if they've got a, a devious intent to destroy the truth and to put forth a lie. And that lie is that somehow the Antichrist won't come until the last seven years of time. That's all a lie. This has all been fulfilled in history. And we're seeing the fulfillment of it right here. 
It says, It is therefore manifest that the Christian sentiment which Eusebius attributes to Constantine was not that exclusive and sectarian sentiment which the clergy at Rome were then endeavoring to establish, and which, as he could readily foresee, would widen rather than to close up the breach. Although he may have favored the Christians there from a general conviction of Christian duty, and given temporal authority to the clergy for motives of state policy only, yet it is also manifest that he did not intend to permit any church organization to grow up at Rome with exterior authority sufficient to control or absorb the legitimate power of the other churches. However much a Christian he may have been, he was now at the head of a pagan empire, and no doubt thought his whole public duty was performed by the establishment of religious toleration. Hence, in dealing with the Arian controversy, he ignored entirely any claim of exclusive jurisdiction on the part of the Bishop of Rome, if any such was set up, which is not probable, and treated the question as one which he, as emperor, was required to submit to all the bishops alike. And this view of the policy of Constantine will sufficiently explain his subsequent dealings with the Roman clergy. And why was that? They got too big for their britches, and he kicked them out of his court and left them to be simply religious leaders. They had no temporal authority anymore. They were to confine themselves to the faith and stay out of government. Now, it says, Socrates gives substantially the same general account as Eusebius and Sozomen, adding the letter of the Bishop of Alexandria. This letter is, a con is as conclusive as it is possible for negative evidence to be upon the question of Romish supremacy at the time. It is addressed, quote, to the bishops constituted in the several cities, unquote, not to the bishop of, of Rome alone. This great Orthodox bishop employs this language, quote, to our beloved and most honored fellow ministers of the Catholic, and in by this he, he, the author even puts in brackets, he's not referring to the Roman Catholic Church, but to the Church Universal, the Church of Jesus Christ everywhere. And this, again, is the, uh, the, uh, the conflict that I always uh, uh, try to avoid and never use the word Catholic to describe the true body of Christ and allow the word Catholic to be used exclusively to refer to the Roman Catholic Church so as not to confuse the listeners. But nonetheless, there are many in the world and throughout history that have referred to the body of Christ as the Catholic Church the universal church, and uh, I, I just choose to stay away from that, that confusion. Now, he says, again, he says, to our beloved and most honored fellow ministers of the Catholic Church everywhere, unquote. He, he complains especially that Eusebius of Nicomedia had taken the side of Arius and argues at length to show the heretical tendency of their teachings. Matters, however, only became worse. Quote, to so disgraceful an extent, says Socrates, was the affair carried that Christianity became a subject of popular ridicule, even in the theaters. Unquote. Eusebius of Nicomedia demanded of the Bishop of Alexandria that the sentence of excommunication he had pronounced against Arius should be rescinded, and many letters were written on both sides some in favoring and some opposing this proposition. The opposing factions became divided in, into quote-unquote sects, and these with the Eunomians, the Macedonians, and the Militians th uh, threatened to put an end to all the harmony that had been previously ex uh, existing in the several churches. And yet Socrates, like Eusebius and Sozman, omits any mention of the bishop or the Church of Rome, either as appealed to by the parties or as inferring to, interfering rather, to quiet the dissensions. 
He makes Hosius the, me the messenger by whom Constantine sent his letter to, of rebuke to Alexander and Arius, but does not connect him in any way with the bishop of Rome. Theodoret also refers to the beginning of the controversy. He inserts a letter from the bishop of Alexandria to the bishop of Constantinople, wherein several other quote-unquote sects are named, besides those mentioned by Socrates, to wit the Ebionites, the Artemontes, the Sabellians, and the Valentinians, who were a branch of the Gnostics, thus demonstrating that sects did not grow out of Protestantism, but justifying the inference that if, it, if they did not necessarily uh, arise out of the attempt to establish Roman exclusiveness, they were increased by it. He publishes the letter of Arius to Eusebius, wherein he calls the Bishop of Alexandria, quote, now listen to this, the Pope Alexander, unquote. And this is the first time that the title Pope appears in any of the so-called Greek fathers in connection with the Arian controversy. It didn't even apply to the Bishop of Rome. And he gives also a letter from Eusebius to the Bishop of Tyre, Nowhere, however, does he refer to the Bishop of Rome or the Pope of Rome as having anything whatsoever to do with either Alexander or Arius or with their respective adherents. But in enumerating the bishops of Rome, Antioch, Jerusalem, and Constantinople, he says, quote, The Church of Rome was at this time ruled by Sylvester, unquote, and neither says nor intimates that he ruled any other of the churches or that he had any more authority than the bishop of any other church. Manifestly, it is a just inference from the fact that no letter is shown to have been addressed to or from him that he was then considered by the whole Christian world as having no such exclusive authority. Now, isn't it strange? As much to do as the Roman Catholic Church, or rather the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church at this time, makes of the precedent set at the Council of Nice in this Arian heresy to justify their union of church and state, to justify the Pope's authority over all the other churches, and the Pope's authority to rid the world of heresy. It's all a fabrication. And it is asserted as such by the best writers of the period. It says, The evidence, therefore, both affirmative and negative, furnished by these early fathers, render it almost positively certain that before the Council of Nice, the Bishop of Rome was not referred to, by appeal or otherwise, as a judge or arbiter to settle the dispute about Arianism, it is necessary in order to ascertain his true relation to that council to know by whom it was convened and under whose auspices its business was conducted. These same authors must also settle this question. Eusebius says, quote, Resolve, therefore, to bring, as it were, a divine array against this enemy. He, that is, Constantine, not the Pope, Constantine convoked a general council and invited the speedy attendance of bishops from all quarters, in letters expressive of the honorable estimation in which he held them, unquote. And he speaks of his summons as a quote-unquote command and a quote-unquote imperial injunction, unquote. Sozaman says that after the letter of the emperor sent by Hosius to Alexander and Arius had failed to restore harmony, quote, Constantine, not the Pope, Constantine convened the Senate of Nicaea in Bithynia, the Council of Nice, and wrote to the most eminent men of the churches in every country, directing them to be there on the appointed day, unquote. Socrates says, quote, When therefore the emperor beheld the church agitated by both of these causes, he convoked a general council, summoning all the bishops by letter to meet him at Nice in Bithynia, unquote. 
Theodoret reference, uh, referring to the failure of Constantine to bring out a reconciliation, says, quote, He therefore proceeded to summon the celebrated Council of Nice and commanded that the bishops and those connected with them should be mounted on the asses, mules, and horses belonging to the public in order to repair thither, unquote. In other words, they were to use public transportation to get there. They weren't to absorb the cost of their own transmission to Nice in Bithynia. They were to use public transportation. Okay? So, <laughs> Constantine was obviously in control. Nowhere is it mentioned anything about the so-called Bishop of Rome, the so-called Pope. And it says, now, with this evidence before us, and this is all we have of these early fathers, beginning with Eusebius, who personally knew all about it, are we not justified in saying that when papal writers say, as Wenninger does, the Jesuit priest, remember, that the Council of Nice was, quote, convoked by Pope Sylvester, unquote, they state as a fact that which is not a fact, to speak in the mildest terms. The plain and well-established truth is that he had nothing more to do with it than the bishops of the other churches, and not so much as some of them, especially those to whom Alexander and Arius had addressed their letters. It was wholly and entirely the work of Constantine the emperor, who never even became a catechumen by baptism in the Church of Rome, whose only Christianity was, quote-unquote, Catholic, that speaking of the body of Christ or the, the established churches, has nothing to do with the Church of Rome, remember? This confusing use of the word Catholic. It says, whose only Christianity was Catholic in the sense of universality and not in the sectarian sense of Rome, and who had not yet become so unselfish as to overlook the worldly object he had in view when he employed the clergy to aid him in the administration of civil affairs, which was to keep himself firmly seated upon the imperial throne. He was willing to unite the church and the state, but no word ever escaped his mouth. So far as his biographer has reported, signifying any other purpose than that of keeping the church below and inferior to the state. On one occasion, when addressing a company of bishops in the presence of Eusebius, he says to them, quote, You are bishops whose jurisdiction is within the church. I also am a bishop ordained by God to overlook whatever is external to the church. Unquote. Now, rem now, that's the clearest statement of the, of the separation of powers, the church and state. And it says, whereby he intended to have it distinctly understood that he should permit no church organization with external powers, either of coercion, that is, to persecute heretics, as, does the, as asserts the Pope of Rome, or otherwise, to intermeddle directly or indirectly with the, the affairs of the empire. In other words, Constantine, who first united church and state, realized that it was a mistake, and he separated the church from the state and made the church subservient to the state. Now, that is directly counter to what the papacy teaches today. Remember, the old world order was after the rise of the man of sin, after the restrainer had left Rome and went to Constantinople, and the restrainer was gone, and the man of sin was revealed, the Pope of Rome, who sits in the temple of God saying that he is God. And then he begins to persecute heresy under the false and lying pretense that that precedent was established by Constantine in Rome when history clearly indicates no such thing occurred. The papacy is a manufactured 
irrigation, it is a man-made institution. Rather, it is a Satan, a satanically inspired institution. Properly called in the Scriptures that man of sin, that son of perdition. And we've been lied to in our churches. I know I have. There's no future Antichrist. We have a historical Antichrist that predates us by millennia. The papacy is that man of sin, the son of perdition. It was only after the emperor left the realm that the Bishop of Rome arrogated to himself powers that neither God nor man willingly gave him, but what he arrogated to himself. It's a man-made institution. It's diabolical, is what it is. Now, the assignment of a direct and immediate agency to the Bishop of Rome in convoking the Council of Nice being false, the other statements of this Jesuit priest Wenninger might be held infer inferentially to be false also. Quote, Falsus in uno, falsus in omnibus. Unquote. Which is an old and well-approved law maxim. Which means if you're false on one count, you might as well be false in all counts. And it says, but as it is a maxim, which, though sometimes true, is said to be of general application, and grave matters like these we are discussing should not be left to inference merely, as other statements should likewise be tested by the proofs. He says, quote, this is the Jesuit priest Wenninger speaking, quote, The sovereign pontiff presided by his three legates, one of whom was Osius, bishop of Cordova, unquote. This statement is more false than the one preceding it. Spencer says in the Fairy Queenie, quote, For he that once hath missed the right way, the further he doth go, the further he doth stray. Unquote. Eusebius, after a general enumeration of the countries from which the distinguished prelates who attended the council came, says, quote, The prelate of the imperial city, that is Rome, the capital city Rome, was prevented from attending by extreme old age. In other words, Sylvester didn't make it. He was just too tired. Okay? But his presbyters were present and supplied his place. In other words, they were his representatives. It says, He does not refer to any other presbyters who were there, and certainly does not include Hosius among those who represented the Bishop of Rome for two reasons. First, because he classes him among the prelates. And second, because in the preceding sentence, referring to Hosius, he had said, quote, even from Spain itself, one whose fame was widely spread took his seat as an individual in the great assembly, unquote. Hence, Hosius, who was the bishop of Cordova in Spain and the only representative of Spain present, took his seat in his own individual right as one of the most distinguished prelates and not as a mere presbyter or a legate of the bishop of Rome of whom he was of the equal in authority and superior in fame. So even the papacy's use of Hosius as a prelate of the Roman Catholic Church is a lie. Lie upon lie. One lie cause calls for another. Now, Sozaman adds his input about this... Uh, these prelates that were supposedly representing the Bishop of Rome at the Council of Nice, Sozaman, referring to the absence of the Bishop of Rome on account of his old, old age, says, quote, But his place was supplied by Vito and Vicentius, presbyters of the church, unquote. No mention of Hosius, is there? Just Vito and Vicentius, presbyters of the church. 
and thus he makes two legates only from Rome, and not three. And who's absent? The illustrious one, Hosius, from Cordova. <laughs> no mention of him as being a representative of the Bishop of Rome. Thus he makes two legates only from Rome and not three, and does not mention Hosius as one of them. Socrates makes no statement on his own authority, but refers approvingly to what Eusebius has said. He says nothing about Hosius being the delegate of Sylvester, but refers to his presbyters. Theodoret does not mention Hosius, but agrees with Sozomen as to the number of the prelates as Eusebius and Sozomen, and Socrates as to their character, that is, that they were presbyters and not bishops. No bishop attended from Rome. It was a council of bishops, wasn't it? The bishop of Rome couldn't make it because he was old. And therefore, there were no bishop representatives from Rome at all at the council. He says, Sylvester, quote, sent two presbyters to the council for the purpose of taking part in all the transactions, unquote. Hosius was not a presbyter of Rome, but was the bishop of Cordova in Spain, as is stated by both Sozomen and Socrates, and could not consequently have been one of the papal legates. But not a word is stated by either of these authors about the bishop of Rome being represented by Hosius, either as one of his legates or in any other capacity. They all, in, they all concur in the, con, in, in the precise contrary, that he was represented by presbyters and not bishops. And Sozomen and Theodore agree that there were only two of these. And why were they only presbyters? The answer is plain. Each one of the churches in Asia, Europe, and Africa had its own bishop and its own distinct jurisdiction. They existed upon terms of perfect equality, none having any private primacy or supremacy over the others. Therefore, when these bishops were summoned by Constantine, not the Pope, by Constantine, those who could not attend in person sent their presbyters, as did the Bishop of Rome, and those who attended represented their own churches." Hosius represented his own church and was a man of far too much celebrity to have surrendered his equality with his brother bishops to play an inferior part in the name of such a bishop as Sylvester, of whom scarcely anything was known beyond the fact of his having been bishop of Rome until the false and forged legends of the monks of the 5th century assigned to him the connection with the Council of Nice, which has ever since been disingenuously repeated by the supporters of the papal power and infallibility. So these, all of these lies form the foundation for the current belief and wisdom of the Roman Catholic Church that the Pope called the Council and he settled the dispute and thereby established himself as the king of kings and lord of lords and the persecutor of heresy in the church. Yes. Okay. Apparently we're still having Internet connection problems. I don't know what the source of these problems are, but we'll wrestle through it as we have before. So... They all concur in the precise contrary that he was represented by presbyters and not bishops, and Sozomen and Theodore agree that there were only two of these. And why were there only presbyters? The answer is plain. Each one of the churches represented were represented by bishops, and no bishop was present from Rome. Okay? And they all existed. All of these bishops existed on perfect equality. None of them had primacy or supremacy over the others. 
all of the assertions made by the Roman Catholic Church are based on lies upon shifting sand. It has no justification for existence, in fact. The papacy is built on nothing but lies. Lie after lie after lie. And why is that? Because he is ruled by the father of lies. But who presided over the Council of Nice? The Jesuit priest Wenninger says, quote, the sovereign pontiff presided by his three legates, unquote. Enough has been said to show that there was no such thing as a sovereign pontiff known or recognized in those days, especially not in the sense here meant. But that need not be dwelt on here. There were but two prelates, and they were both presbyters only. Can any man of intelligence suppose that such an assembly, composed of so many distinguished bishops, at a time like that when rank and station had attached to them far more dignity and influence and influence than they now have would have submitted to be presided over by mere presbyters? It is said that these prelates, these so called prelates of, of the Bishop of Rome, presided over the council. Yet they were presbyters. They were not of the authority and stature to preside over anything. And it says, the supporters of the monkish fable have deserved this difficulty, have, have observed this difficulty, but have proved themselves equal to it by increasing the papal legates to three and making Hosius one of them. So they're just using Hosius to get him out of this jam. Hosius was late coming into the picture. They had to come up with a bishop to cover the, 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 the assertion that the Pope's legates presided over the, over the council. And it says there were a large number of uh, present besides him of eminent ability. Eusebius says, quote, Some were distinguished by wisdom and eloquence, others by gravity of their lives and by patient fortitude of character, while others again united in themselves all these graces. And he speaks of men among them, quote, whose years demanded the tribute, the tribute of respect and veneration, unquote. Socrates mentions two of the extraordinary celebra uh, celebrities, the Bishop of Upper Thebes and of Cyprus. Who of all these presided? There's no positive answer to this question. In other words, nobody can tell you who precisely presided over that council. It says, manifestly, it was not considered a matter of any special consequence, and certainly not as any, in any way affecting the merits or validity of what was done, or the fact would have been stated. Eusebius says that upon the assembling of the body, quote, the bishop who occupied the chief place in the right division of the assembly then rose and addressing the emperor delivered a concise speech, unquote. But he doesn't even say who this was, nor does Sozomen or Socrates or Theodoret. But Eusebius shows enough to dispel the papal fiction and forgery that one of the Pope's legates presided by the statement of the fact of which he had personal knowledge that, quote, a bishop, unquote, and not a presbyter presided. So it couldn't have been one of the Pope's so-called legates. It was just one of the other bishops of equal power and authority and esteem who first addressed the council. They don't even know who it was. So how can the Bishop of Rome assert what he does? It says, Wenninger says, quote, Hosius, whom Anast uh, Athanasius styled the leader of the council, occupied the first place, unquote. If this were an established fact, it would prove only this 
that in order to support the claim of Romish supremacy, its advocates originated the false assertion that he was one of the papal legates without a single word of authority from any responsible or reliable quarter. In other words, they just made it up. Athanasius became Bishop of Alexandria in 326 A.D., the year of the council. He was present at the council as a deacon, and whatever is found in his writings in reference to it is entitled to the greatest consideration and ought to be accepted as true. In his second apology, he calls, quote, Hosius the father and president of all the councils, unquote, not specially the Council of Nice. Okay, that's what we're talking about, the Council of Nice. Who was the president of the, of the Council of Nice? That's what's at question. And it says he certainly does not say here that he was the leader of that council, the Council of Nice. Between the beginning of the 4th century and the Council of Nice, there were 12 councils assembled. To which of these did Athanasius refer? If to all, including that of Nice, that it was merely probable that Hosius presided over that council. But it is more probable that he designedly employed general language. Because like Eusebius, Sozomen, Socrates, and Theodoret, he did not consider the presidency of the Council of Nice as a matter of any special importance. Otherwise, he would undoubtedly have stated who presided there, for he knew precisely what the fact was. At all events, he leaves it in doubt whether he intended to include Nice or not. And reasoning thus, Dupin, the learned Roman Catholic historian, says upon this question, quote, "'Tis not certainly known who presided in this council, but tis very probable that it was Hosius." Unquote. But upon this hypothesis, he proceeds immediately to say that he did so, quote, "'in his own name,' unquote, and therefore not in the name of the Bishop of Rome or as one of his legates. And in a note to this text, it is stated that at least two writers, Proclus and Facundus have alleged that Athanasius, bishop of Antioch, presided. It then continues, quote, But it is more probable that Hosius presided there in his own name and not in the Pope's, for he nowhere assumes the title of legate of the Holy See, and none of the ancients say that he presided in this council in the Pope's name. Galatius Cisicinus, who first affirmed it, says it, quote, without any proof or authority, unquote. But there is other cumulative evidence to the same effect, also from the very highest Roman Catholic authority. Trillamont, in his learned and instructive history of the, of the Arians and of the Council of Nice, disposes of this question in a very decisive and expressive language. Alluding to the council, and after stating that it was convoked by Constantine and not by the Bishop of Rome, he says, quote, Neither Eusebius nor the ancient historians say anything of St. Sylvester's sending any other legates to the Council of Nice but two priests, Vitus and Vicentius. There is none but Galatius Cisicinus who says that Hosius of Cordoba had the same post. His authority, how inconsiderable it soever it be, could not be but of weight if it was not certain that he corrupts the text of Eusebius by inserting this and some other clauses, unquote. So here's the corruption. They've inserted language into the record. And it says, then referring to the pretense that Hosius presided over the council in the name of the bishop of Rome, and to the language of Athanasius already quoted, he continues, quote, We have even some authorities for believing that it was St. Eustasius of Antioch who presided in the council. For John of Antioch, writing to St. Proclus about the year 435, gives him the title of, quote-unquote, first, 
of the holy fathers assembled at Nice, and Facundus the first of that council. It is collected from Theodoret that he had the first place on the right hand and that he made a speech to Constantine in the name of all the bishops, which of course belongs to the president. It is thought the same might be shown from St. Jerome. The, chronic, uh, the Chronicon of Nicephorus calls him expressly the chief of the fathers at Nice. St. Anastasius Sanati, uh, Sanata might likewise mean the same thing, and the title of president is found in a letter attributed to, uh, to Pope Felix III, which would be much more considerable authority if there were not many reasons to in, induce us to believe that this piece is not older than the uh, that that is not older than the eighth century. Many many centuries later. In a note, it is said, Galatius Cisicinus, who lived at the end of the 5th century, is the first we find who says that Hosius was the Pope's legate of the Council of Nice with the priests Vito and Vicentius. He even reports this fact as a thing very authentic, since he inserts it in the text of Eusebius as if it belonged to it but it is not found there in the printed copies. Vicent, uh, Val uh, Valesius takes no notice of anything like it in the manuscripts, and it is even evident that the text of that historian cannot be read as, Galesi uh, as Galatius quotes it without a manifest corruption and perverting his sense. It's a forgery. It says, quote, All that can be said of this pretended delegation of Hosius is that all the historians mention his assisting at the Council of Nice and speak of legates who were sent thither by the Pope, but that no author more ancient than Galatius, nor perhaps any more modern, who is worth notice in this matter, puts Hosius in the number of those legates. Even in the Synodicon, which in other respects is full of faults, does by no means place Hosius among the Pope's legates, unquote. Thus is this falsehood, which, originally, which originated nearly 200 years after the Council of Nice, completely disposed by uh, completely disposed of by authorities which no honest searcher of the truth can disregard until it was invented as a cover for papal usurpations not one word was to be found anywhere in any history showing or even tending to show that Hosius was one of the Pope's legates or, presi or presided in his name the forgery has its parallel only in the false decretals, and we'll talk about those again. They're also known as the pseudo-Isidorian decretals. All forgeries, lie upon lie, it says the forgery has its parallel only in the false decretals which soon followed it. If he did preside in any name other than his own, it is far more likely to have been that of Constantine than the Bishop of Rome. Constantine convened the council and was present. The Bishop of Rome had nothing to do with it except to send his representatives as he was prevented by old age from attending in person like other bishops. We know nothing of the relations between him and Hosius except that they were bishops of distinct and independent churches one in Italy and the other in Spain. But we do know, as Dupin says, that Hosius, quote, was much esteemed by the emperor, unquote, and that he was, according to the intimation of Eusebius and the statements of Sozomen and Socrates, the messenger by whom he, that is Constantine, sent his letter of rebuke to Alexander and Arius. This would give some plausibility to the belief that he presided in the emperor's name, but this is of no importance 
since the question before us involves simply the truth or falsehood of the pretense that Hosius presided in the name of the Pope. This is to be shown not only unsupported by the word of proof, but absolutely false, a bold and unblushing forgery. Jesuit priest Renninger, Wenninger says again, quote, The fathers were guided in their deliberations by these instructions, that is, those of the Pope to his legates, as well as by the symbol of faith prescribed by Sylvester and brought from Rome, unquote. If history did not furnish the most positive proof of the falsity of what is here asserted, it might be supposed to be true because of the frequency of its repetition, merely by the frequency of its repetition and the apparent sincerity with which it is made. But like what has gone before it, it vanishes before the touchstone of truth. The council was disturbed at the very beginning by angry discussions among the discordant bishops. Says Eusebius, quote, some began to accuse their neighbors who defended themselves and, recrimination in, and recriminated in their turn, unquote. He continues further, he says, in this manner numberless assertions were put forth by each party and a violent controversy arose at the very commencement, unquote. The contending parties seem to have addressed themselves not merely to the assembly itself, but to the emperor. Manifestly, he was regarded as the ruling spirit of the council. He probably did not attempt to employ his imperial authority to control its deliberations, but it is unquestionably true that they were mainly influenced by the deference paid to it by a majority of the prelates. It is probable even that many of them were absolutely governed by it. Eusebius says as much in this, that notwithstanding the violence of the discussion, quote, the emperor gave patient audience to all alike and received every proposition with fast attention, and by occasionally assisting the argument of each party in turn, he gradually disposed even the most vehement disputations to a reconciliation. Sounds like he was in charge, doesn't it? No mention made of the Pope, is there? Constantine ruled over the Council of Nice. He called the Council of Nice. Everybody referred to him during the Council of Nice. No mentions made of the Pope of Rome. No mention is made of the Pope of Rome or the Bishop of Rome. And only brief mention of two representatives both of which were presidents. Humpty Dumpty sat Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. And we'll talk about the fall of Rome's support.